That would be awesome. All right, get up here, Seth Harper. This thing is on. It has a freaking laser. A laser? I don't think you should trust me with that. <laughs> I don't trust you with that. I'm getting over there and putting on my... I'm a natural scientist. <laughs> natural scientist. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Seth Harper. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, so this is my second nerd night, and I really enjoyed it the first time. Um, so yeah, my name is Seth Harper. I am a horticulturist at the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. I don't know if any of you know about it, but it's the, yeah, we got some fans. Okay, uh, it's the oldest museum in Chicago. You should probably check it out. Uh, we had a little uh, problem with a thing called the Great Fire, so that kind of set us back a little ways. Uh, but we're really back on our feet now, um, so come check it out. But uh, one of the things I get to do with the Nature Museum that I really enjoy, um, I have the privilege of writing for the museum's blog on occasion, and um, one of the early blogs I did, I kind of uh, got a lesson in, in corporate think when I tried to do something, you know, I tried to present something that I thought was a real interesting botanical factoid, but it turned out that um, I, I was not allowed to print the blog I wrote. I just simply mentioning the plant in question Pro would maybe prompt someone to Google it, and if someone Googles it, then Rule 34 applies. And so, um, so I was not able to ever do that blog, and I told Jason about this, and he got really excited about it. And he's been really pushing me on the booty coconut for quite a long time. Um, <laughs> so I would like to thank Nerd Knight for letting me get my botanical freak on. Um, <laughs> okay, so the booty coconut. Now, now to to talk about the booty coconut, I would not take up an entire talk, so we're going to put it in context, and we're going to talk about fruit and the ways fruit enable plants to distribute themselves around the world. And um, so the first thing we need to do that is to talk about, oh look, there's my first slide, I probably should have shown you that already, um, to talk about what a fruit is, and a fruit, you know, the botanical definition, of course, is a reproductive structure derived from the ovary of a flower that contains seeds, protecting these as they develop and aiding in the dispersal. And there are exceptions to this um, that I won't get into, but basically everything in nature has exceptions, so this definition does not cover all plants. But, so the general, here's a cross-section of a flower, and I think everybody understands the basics of pollination. And where's the laser on this? Oh, here it is. So the pollen comes off of here, it goes on to here, it travels down here, pretend it's sperm, pretend these are eggs, okay? It's basically the same thing. And this is the womb where the eggs are in, the ovary, very similar to, you know, people. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, we're all, we're all the same genes, people. Okay, so, so this is the ovary, and then this ovary, after pollination, uh, develops into a fruit for protecting and dispersing these seeds. And we've highlighted dispersal because that's really what we're gonna be talking about here today. Um, so there are many different types of fruit, and they are generally uh, categorized in two distinct ways, dry versus fleshy, dehiscent versus indehiscent. Uh, a, a dehiscent fruit will uh, open itself to release its seeds uh, rather than just sitting the way it is like a, an indehiscent fruit would do. Now, of course, being um, botany, which is one of the natural sciences, one of their main jobs is to simply come up with excessively complex names for everything. So there are excessively complex names for every single type of fruit out there. And I have been in this business for 15 years, and I took... Uh, um, systematics in college, which most horticulturists do not do, and I today saw two new words when I was putting this slide together that I've never seen before. So that tells you how many terms we like to come up with. If there's going to be a drinking game here, which I didn't come up with one, but you might just want to take a drink anytime you see an unnecessarily complex term for something. Um, <laughs> so again, the function of the fruit to contain, protect things while ripening, and then distribute the seed. So there are different ways that, and, and I know you guys really want to get to the booty coconut, like you're all waiting, right? <laughs> Jason in particular, I mean, he's just been disturbingly fascinated about this. I'm kind of worried about the guy. He's been bugging me for months, but anyway, we're going to get to that, but we're working on context now. So anyway, um, so how do fruits distribute themselves? Well, one of the ways that a lot of fruits use is called endozoochory. That is a word. Um, 
So, endozoochore, which means fruits that feed animals, the animals, by either carrying off the fruit, ripping apart the fruit, or ingesting the fruit, and then pooping out the seeds, distribute the plant's seeds um, for it. And so the example we're looking at here is a saguaro cactus from the southwestern U.S. And um, the saguaro takes sort of the town bicycle approach to uh, seed distribution. Everybody gets a turn at the fruit. Um, so, and this is a good strategy if you live, especially if you're in a desert where the animal density is a little bit lower. When you're fruiting, you want every animal you can find to come out there and grab that fruit and tear it apart and spread those seeds. So, uh, saguaros are generalists in this regard. So you get finches, woodpeckers, foxes, doves, bats, tortoises, javelinas, anybody who knows what a javelina is gets bonus points today, coyotes, even humans, eat this fruit, and so you get this massive distribution going on. So this is one good way of doing it, um, but it's not the only way. A lot of other plants kind of take a different approach, where they find a particular species that distributes the fruit, and then they continue to evolve to perfect that relationship over time, so that that single distributor of the fruit becomes highly specialized to consume it, and vice versa. Um, and one case of that that's um, native to our uh, well, not native to here, but native to North America, would be the Osage Orange. So this is the Osage Orange, and you may have seen these when you were a kid and probably thrown them at each other. Um, so this, uh, this plant originates in the central plains of the U.S., but it's been distributed all over the country. It grows in 48 states now, and one of the reasons is that people plant them for fence rows because they have nasty thorns, and they were a great way to keep your cattle in place. Um, so there's this giant fruit that they make, and why would they do this, okay? So clearly, if you make a fruit like that, you're wanting to feed something with it, right? There's no other way that that's gonna get distributed. It's just gonna fall to the ground. So how are you gonna distribute that fruit? Well, what's gonna eat that? Um, interestingly, nothing really does. And for a long time, this was rather a mystery, and we couldn't figure out exactly why this plant bothered to make these giant fruits. But then we realized that once upon a time on, in this continent, um, over this range that we can barely see the range map here uh, of West Texas or sorry East Texas and Oklahoma, there were um, some other critters such as this that probably ate some of those. Anybody knows what this is? It's a Jefferson ground sloth. It is. It's a giant ground sloth. Giant ground sloth. And so this creature has only been extinct for like you know a few millennia. So. Imagine that it was distributing seeds all over the continental U.S. by eating those things. And now that it's, that distributor no longer exists, the Osage Orange is relying on us to distribute its seeds because we like the things it does for us. In fact, this fruit has a lot of very interesting natural history, but the, one of the things about the Osage Orange is that the Osage Indians found that it made very good arrow shafts. And as such, they jealously guarded the home range of the Osage Orange and really became well, arms traders in essence because they would sell these or trade these um, arrow shafts from their, or their Osages in, on their lands to other Indians. Uh, that was an aside in case you couldn't tell. Um, now we're going to talk about Myrmica, oh, yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, this is ants distributing and please, yeah, go ahead. Um, this is, a, this is how ants can distribute seed. And you notice I crossed out fruit because we're not actually talking about fruit here. We're talking about seeds inside fruits. This is uh, Sanguinaria canadensis, bloodroot, an American wildflower. Um, this is the seed pod. When it opens, you have a seed like this. And this weird thing on the top is called an ileosome. And an ileosome is a, a fatty tissue that ants find delicious. They get the seeds, they carry them off to their burrows, and uh, eat the ileosome, but leave the seed alone. And so then the seeds are distributed by the ants. And I'm, I'm only including this here because I know we're talking about fruits, but I'm including this because we're going to call back to this. Um, so remember this um, Myrmica. <sighs> okay. Um, so now, fruits that fly, this one's kind of boring. Everybody knows about this. You got dandelions, milkweeds. The only really interesting thing about this slide is, you know, um, I learned today um, the Italian words for elm, ash, and maple. Thank you, Wikipedia Commons. Um, so yeah, everybody knows about that one. Fruits that fling, though this is a fun one, ballistic cori. So, 
I don't know where your minds are right now, why everyone's giggling, but anyway, <laughs> fruits that fling. So uh, we, we have a lot of like common examples, like common weeds like violets, uh, wood sorrel, and then there's garden plants like impatiens uh, that people often call touch-me-nots, where you touch the seed, it goes poof, and, or the fruit goes poof, and the seeds go flying everywhere. Okay, so this is explosive seed dispersal, ballisticory. Um, it's a little complicated to describe the process, but if you could imagine uh, two layers of tissue, and they're sort of horizontally opposed to each other, Okay, and then they dry at different rates, and as they dry up, one's drying faster than the others, and then it suddenly gives way and pops, and that's how the seeds fly off. Um, so that's how most ballisticory works, but not all of it. Um, <clears throat> there are always exceptions in nature. Uh, so some of the plants I've got up here to demonstrate this, to look at this process, this over here is called the, oh, that's called the wrong button is what that's called. Uh, this is called the sandbox tree, uh, Hura crepitans. The fruit size and shape of tangerines, as you can probably tell. Uh, each segment contains one half inch long seed. The fruits will burst open upon drying. They will shoot their seeds nearly 50 yards, accompanied by the explosive noise that sounds like a gun. Uh, so you can imagine being a forest of these at just the right time. These are native to uh, Florida even. so. Watch out when you're in Florida, Floridian forests. Um, this plant over here, however, holds the actual record for the most distance. This is Tetra Berlinia moreliana, which throws seeds almost 200 feet. So congratulations, Tetra Berliniana. Um, thank, a little bit of applause. Thank you. So now, I'm going to do the call back to the Myrmica, yeah, um, the distribution of seeds by ants, because I want to describe this plant because it's amazing. This is a plant native to Australia called Palatostigma pubescens, and this plant has one of the most complex distribution methods in all of nature that have yet been discovered. So this plant uh, produces these fruits. The fruits are relished by emus, so the emus eat all the fruits, then they wander around pooping them out everywhere, as birds do. Uh, the piles of emu poop sit in the sun, and they warm up and dry up, and eventually as those fruits dry up, the non-digestible parts of them then explode, creating exploding piles of emu poop <laughs> that then fling the seeds of the plant some distance. But they also, on top of that, they have an ileosome that then the ants will grab and eat and drag the seed off. So they have a three-stage distribution process endozoochory, ballisticory, myrmic, and they do it, all three, to distribute their seeds. So you, I, I can't imagine the evolutionary cascade that must have happened to make that come to be. But, so if you ever see an exploding pile of emu poop, you know why. Inside the emu? Maybe if it got really dry in there somehow? I don't know. But it has to dry first, so. Yes, yes. Relished by Emus is my band, actually. Uh, <laughs> so um, now we're going to talk about fruits that cling, epizoochory. <laughs> okay, so um, we have here, this is really common in a couple of plant families, the aster family, the carrot family. We have on the left a cockle burr which is pretty common in farm fields and everywhere else. This is the old uh, sand burr, which you may have found if you've visited southeastern beaches to be extremely painful. Um, this is a little friend called Hekelia virginiana, which is really common around here and is probably the worst. I mean, I've literally, you, I mean, you get this on synthetic fabrics, like you wear your yoga pants and, and, <laughs> and encounter that, which I, I've never done personally, but I had a volunteer at the museum do that once. She's not a volunteer anymore. Um, that yoga pants had to go in the trash. So that's probably the worst one I know of. But there's also this weird little beast um, called Proboscoidea louisianica. So it's native to North America. It grows over a large span of North America. And it uh, obviously is going to hook onto something, right? This fruit's going to hook onto something, get carried somewhere. You know, those little slots there allow seeds to fall out over time. And so you imagine that. 
uh, this plant probably evolved to hook onto some large animal that's going to carry it around. Um, and it will, it will latch onto something like a deer hoof, and they do a fairly good job of distributing it. But, you know, you don't need to be that big to hook onto a deer hoof or a deer leg. So the question arises if, if that was originally the distributor, or if, again, there's some creature that no longer is around that was responsible for mainly distributing this plant that evolved, that the plant evolved to use as its, as its distribution method. And so the theory is that it may be our good old friends, the mastodon, which had a very similar and wide range and had a lot of fur and could have carried those guys around for some distance. Um, uh, interesting aside, which I did not know until today, mastodons are a new world species. Mammoths are old world. Did you know that? Learned that today. <clears throat> so yeah, fruits that cling to who exactly? Well, we're not quite sure, but that's a good theory. So now we're really close to talking about the booty coconut. So Jason, please, yeah, we're getting really close. Uh, <laughs> Getting close. So, but first we need to talk about fruits that float, uh, which is hydrocory. Um, so, this is the most obvious example: is the coconut. Everybody knows a coconut lives by the seashore. The the nuts, the the fruits are very large. They float away on the tide. They land on some other island, and then they germinate and produce a new coconut tree. So that's a great way to distribute yourself. Um, the coconut probably originated in the West Indies, or sorry, in the Indian Ocean somewhere, and it can float on currents for quite some time. But um, it really isn't able to get all the way to Florida by itself. That, that took us to help it to get there because we eat it and we like it. Um, so that's an example of what they call a drift fruit or a drift seed. There are a lot of other drift fruits and drift seeds, which we won't get into, uh, but it's not like the coconut is the only one. So when I was researching the booty coconut, my immediate assumption was that it was also a drift fruit. So here's the booty coconut. All right. <laughs> This plant is, <laughs> Jason, any comments? <laughs> okay, the booty coconut, nobody calls it the booty coconut but Jason St. John, okay? He invented that name, <laughs> it's his claim to fame. It is, no, no, it is called Coco de Mer, which is, you know, coconut of the sea, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it is a palm species. Um, it is endemic to a couple of islands in the Seychelles Islands. Um, it is uh, a, a CITES listed species. It is endangered, uh, mostly because people collect the seeds for some odd reason. Um, so virtually no natural reproduction has been occurring for this species because people keep carrying off this, the uh, seeds. But um, there are now some ornamental populations in other places, and they've established some reserve populations. So it's probably not going to go extinct anytime soon. But yeah, because it's a CITES species, it, you, you, if you get caught with one of these, you're in trouble. Um, this, this right here, by the way, this is the male inflorescence, <laughs> which may be shocking to you. But the plants are either male or female, uh, the entire plant being either male or female. And you don't know until maybe 45 years, because they may not start blooming until they're that age. And then even after those 45 years, they start blooming. Uh, it takes another six years for a single fruit to develop. And then that fruit takes two years to germinate. Uh, it starts off by using all that reserved energy in that giant seed to send a shoot down into the ground about 20 feet and then it will finally start growing. So, um, the, these guys, had, these pods of these things had been washing up on shore at different places all over the world, and people had always, it, it was sort of a mythical thing, like what is this fruit, where is it from? Obviously it's got some sort of magical powers, right? Um, and it wasn't actually, the tree was not actually discovered until 1768. Um, but really, the interesting thing about this, again, I said, like, when I started reaching this, I was researching this, I was thinking, okay, well, this is a drift fruit, clearly, right? It has to drift in the sea to get different places. But the viable fruits are so heavy that they cannot actually float. So it leaves an interesting question as to why they're so big and why and how they are distributed. They, they can't roll, they can't float, no animal's going to carry them off. They're just going to fall right down beside the tree and then have to compete with their parent for sunlight and nutrients. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and I'd like to know more about that. Um, anyway, this holds the world record for both the heaviest fruit and the heaviest single seed. The fruits can be up to 42 kilograms, the seeds themselves up to 17 kilograms. So anyway, 
Um, as you can see, they do have a certain appealing shape that humans have found interesting for quite a long time. Oh, by the way, there's this, this I forgot to mention this, this cute little guy, this little lizard up here. Um, this is a native uh, lizard on the Seychelles, and it, they actually think that it probably is one of the primary pollinators of this plant. So it's carrying the pollen to the female uh, flowers by accident. Um, anyway, so humans find this appealing, and so we have collected them over the years. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we think they might have medicinal properties, whatever, they probably don't. But, you know, you know, it's the old doctrine of signatures where it goes like, oh, if it looks like something, it must be good for it. Sort of like, uh, <laughs> oh, this was a thing. And this, you know, like the hepatica had a kidney-shaped leaf. And so for many years, people thought it must be good for kidney ailments. You know, obviously, this is primitive thinking. And as nerd night scientist types, we don't subscribe to that anymore. But uh, that was a very popular doctrine for a very long time. So the distribution of the, uh, the booty coconut is, is kind of a mystery. But basically speaking, what's going on with it now, the reason it's su still alive and succeeding is that we've taken an interest in it. Okay? And so there are numerous fruits that we take an interest in, and thus we distribute by anthropocori. Um, so this is you know, distribution by, usually by feeding us, okay? So producing something that we like to eat, and so we cultivate it, reproduce it, distribute it, and we are the most effective distributors of seeds on the planet. No other type of fruit distribution is more effective than being tasty. Um, and so, specifically, we're talking here about anything, you know, there's also vegetables, you could talk about lettuce and the leaves are tasty, but we're talking about fruit today. So basically, anything that contains a seed, including grains, like this corn, uh, those are actually each individual fruits. They're called a caryopsis. Or something like, another crazy word, yeah. Um, or something like this dill, where we like the flavor of the seeds as a spice. You know, all of these things we are distributing willy-nilly all over the world so we can grow them for our own benefit. So you might say, well, they're not really using us. We're using them, right? Well, I would say sort of, because these plants have become vastly more successful by having the genetic propensity and adaptability to exploit the new seed distribution methods created by agriculture. So they have succeeded in exploiting us as both a means of cultivation and of distribution. Uh, and that leads us back to the coco de mer. We distribute it because we are intrigued by it. Now, interestingly, as you know, uh, a, a different way of distributing seed by humans, we're not just about feeding us, but there's other ways that we use plants too. And one of those is to express our culture. And most of our culture is based on sex. So, so we, there are fruits that exploit our sexuality in order to distribute themselves around the world. And this, follow me on this, because it really makes sense. So these are penis gourds, okay? Um, these gentlemen are from the highlands of New Guinea. And uh, they, among other cultures, use penis gourds uh, as clothing. And uh, it may surprise you to learn there's little correlation between the size or length of the penis gourd and the social status of the wearer. They just wear them for practical reasons. If you ask them why they're wearing a penis gourd, they look crazy, lay at you like you're crazy, and say, to cover my penis. So, um, so they wear the penis gourds. and the. Really, the interesting thing about this is that this plant that they're using, this is, this is a calabash gourd, okay, that they use. They grow these specifically for their penis gourds. They're not native to New Guinea. So they had to get a hold of these somewhere thousands of years ago, seeds to come over here and grow them and start putting them on our penises. And <laughs> so think about it. That seed was able to distribute itself. That fruit was able to distribute itself. That plant was able to reproduce itself clear across the world because we like to put it on our dicks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like when you're growing this calabash gourd, you can put stone weights tied in onto it to stretch it or to curve it around into elaborate directions. Uh, it can be quite, quite, quite an art. Um, but if you think about it, now that we have started using it this way and we continue to use it this way and we select for ones that produce nice gourds for us to use this way, this fruit will continue to evolve based on human specifications for penis covering. So one can imagine how this might affect average fruit girth or the strength of fruit walls or coloration or anything like that. So this plant is going to continue to evolve to fill our need 
for penis covering. Um, another plant would be these nice little guys. Uh, these are called these are called Peter peppers. Um, <laughs> Quite literally. Um, so this is just capsicum anum. This is just a hot pepper, right? But somebody discovered that this particular cultivar looks um, not Jewish. And so a, <laughs> so they've been cultivating it and reproducing it. And every, every time, you know, when I get my garden catalogs in the spring and I'm picking out vegetables to grow, I see this one and they're always in the catalog. They're like, order fast, these sell out. So I just want to just leave you with the thought that Peter Peppers, what they're really doing here, they're succeeding, they're distributing, their fruit is distributing seeds very well. And the reason they're doing this is they're exploiting an evolutionary advantage that only exists because of our dirty minds. So thank you all very much. Questions? Comments? Is it everything you thought it would be, Jason? That was amazing. <laughs> I see some hot peppers are hotter than others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> question. You have a question back here. Can you go back, like, to the first slide? The very first of slide? Of the um, coconut booty. The booty coconut? Yeah, okay. that one. Yeah. Is that the front or the back? <laughs> It looks basically the same on both sides. Okay, it's thank you. It's very similar on both sides. Just curious. Yeah, yeah so here's a couple of seeds. Uh, this oh, one sorry. likes a hairier look, you know. <laughs> I'll give you one. Are there, t are there two seeds, or is that just no, a No, that is a seed? single seed. So uh, if you imagine, say, a pea or a bean, where there are basically two halves and a little tiny thing in between. So the little tiny thing in between is the embryo. The two halves are called cotyledons. They will form the first initial leaves called seed leaves. And those actually contain most of the nutrients that the brand new plant will need to grow to get started. But um, so those are the two cotyledons and then the embryo is there in between. Um, this is in line with the earlier, this is really loud. Um, uh, endo to anthro uh, examples you were giving. Another giant sloth theory that I'd heard before was that they used to eat avocados. And there's some evidence that avocados were quite common, became less common, and then became very common again. And that's roughly tied to giant sloths being around, eating them, distributing them. Us there eating the delicious giant sloths. <laughs> avocados slowly dying out. And then us realizing avocados are pretty damn yeah, delicious right? as well. Well, two points about that. One, there's, there's a coming avocado shortage. Uh, avocados have boomed in the last five years, and we're consuming them very rapidly, and there's just not enough supply at this point. So look for prices to skyrocket. If you want to invest, maybe look to avocado investment. Um, <clears throat> another point of that is, like, we don't really realize just, like, when uh, people crossed the Bering Land Bridge into North America and started hunting those animals, like the giants lost, like whatever remnants from the ice ages were left, like woolly mammoths, etc. They caused massive changes. And, and so, like, we think that, you know, there, North America was kind of this pristine environment until white people came. But no, not so. The Indians were, w had completely altered that environment by the time we got there. And they were maintaining open spaces on prairies by burning them. They had extincted all the charismatic megafauna like the sloth. So uh, everywhere humans go, we make massive changes, and it doesn't just take modern technology to do that. So I have also heard that evidence, actually, that humans were responsible for them disappearing is a little bit thin on the ground. It's just a really well, nice idea. You know, but yeah. I, I do like the idea there's the tragedy that we'll never know what a giant sloth avocado taco would taste like. So. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, Jurassic Park. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that charismatic megafauna is my new favorite phrase from this talk. I, I, didn't, I didn't actually mean to throw charismatic in there, I just meant megafauna, but the term charismatic megafauna is used so much in my business that I, I threw it in there accidentally. But that basically means like elephants and giraffes and rhinoceroses and stuff like that. People, people, 
ac or stuff that actually people will spend money to save as opposed to an endangered clam species that no one gives two shits about. <laughs> so all the money gives goes to charismatic <laughs> macrofauna and the clams are fucked. So <laughs> charismatic megafauna as a band. Megafauna, yeah. I like it. Why do, you th why do you think the plants that were meant for the sloths and the animals? Well, I mean, it's just uh, what, what you're seeing is that their range may have shrunk considerably or uh, that they may have um, relied on other means, such as, again, human beings' arrival and preservation of those species. Um, or it could just be that what we're seeing is that there are fewer of them, they're less well distributed, but they're still able to get by with other means of distribution. If you think about something like the Osage Orange, well, yeah, all they can do is drop that fruit on the ground and maybe the occasional squirrel will roll one away a little bit, but that's still distribution. It's just not as effective as it could be. So they probably eventually would go extinct without human intervention at this point. So. I think we've got time for one more. Do people eat the booty coconut? What do they taste like? Are the they delicious? <laughs> Succulent. Question of the night. Um, people, you can eat the booty coconut. I know that it is edible. I do not know that it is good. Um, I, I, I do know that it's edible. It has supposed medicinal purposes. I don't know. Uh, it's so rare and uh, so well protected, I wouldn't recommend cracking one open to try and eat it or Interpol's gonna be on your ass or something. I don't know, so, sorry I can't tell you. More things we can't recommend, but you learned at Nerd Night. There you go. <laughs> All right, you have some talks to choose wrong. Okay. Give it up for Seth Harper. <laughs> Okay, so Monsanto's Next Quest <laughs> as an alternate title for your talk. But her face, I mean fruit, but her fruit. <laughs> mm. uh, finding patterns in nature, or why I need to get out more. <laughs> uh, it's probably safer to Google how to make plutonium at work than how <laughs> plants reproduce. <laughs> That's not bad. Uh, sisterhood of the Traveling Booty Coconut. Fruits carried by swallows. <laughs> extra... What do you mean? An African... Minus blah blah, or how to spread your seed. <laughs> fruity, 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 rocket everywhere. <laughs> You'd have to know the song. That is brilliant. Uh, I like big fruits and I cannot lie. That's brilliant. Coco Chanel brought us Coco de Mer. Burberry presents Penis Gourd. <laughs> Peter Piper's Nightmare. Peter Piper picked a peck of penis peppers. <laughs> That's my favorite thing I've said all day. How fruit, move it, move it. And finally, plants versus zombies versus giant sloths. <laughs> Your pick. Oh, those are all good, and I'm extremely tempted to go with the Monty Python reference, but uh, I think I'm gonna have to go with Peter Piper. Very yeah. awesome, yeah. okay. Jacob, get up here. Thanks very much, thanks for coming.